from Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. The NSF has created a new directorate called TIP, Technology, Innovation and Partnerships. Here to talk about that and NSF's broader scientific and engineering mission is the director of the National Science Foundation, Seth Raman Panchanathan. Mr. Director, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So start by giving us um, an idea historically of some of the projects that NSF has funded that has directly impacted the public. So let's take two concrete examples. This morning when you got up, you must have been wondering about the weather today. And if you look at all the science that went behind the weather prediction, the modeling, and all the computational efforts that go into it, all of this has fundamental basis in terms of NSF-funded projects over the last several decades. And we are perfecting it every time through solid science and therefore solid technological uh, advancements that we make. The second example, if you drove into work today, you probably used a GPS. And again, all the technologies that contributed towards you navigating through the traffic and the AI algorithms that helped you navigate in an automated way, all of that was made possible because of the tremendous work that NSF has invested in and the great ideas that came through those investments that led to these outcomes. Well, NSF was created by Congress in 1950. What led to that? What was the motivation for that creation? A great question. So in 1945, when we came out of World War II, a great scientist, and I would call him a fantastic leader and a visionary leader, uh, Dr. Vannevar Bush at MIT, proposed to the president saying that, now that we've come out of the war and we have had some amazing innovations like radar and so on, can we have science and technology investments such that we will be able to continue with these innovations that benefits humanity, society, and the economy? And so that led to the creation of NSF in 1950 through an act of Congress. And with explicit mission, of promoting the progress of science, of course, science, engineering, and technology for the benefit of humanity, advancing health, prosperity, welfare, and also securing national defense. Well, make the, your, your budget is around $9 billion. Yeah. Make the case for us that it should be the government spending that money and investing in science as opposed to private industries because they benefit, they, they make a profit in the end. When they, when they have an innovation, they make a lot of money. Yeah. So we want to make sure that industry thrives and prospers. But when you look at to the earlier question that you asked, when you look at early stage technologies, investments in fundamental research that makes things possible, essentially government de-risks the in investments basically to make sure that scientific ideas and scientific technology, emerging technologies are invested into the point where venture capital and industry is able to either take those technologies and ideas and then quickly, rapidly prototype them and productize them and, and make it possible to have good, great services and great technologies that come out that we use every day. So the government has a role in terms of de-risking, investing in fundamental research activities, and NSF has contributed immensely through those investments turning into fantastic ideas, and let's not forget the talent. The talent that is trained, that is what goes to industry, the talent, the great you know, uh, idea uh, thought leaders that go to industry and then create not only new products and technologies in the industries that they are, but also create new industries of the future. You mentioned the word risk because your mission includes um, this. It says, quote, um, to go after high risk, potentially transformative research projects that will generate pathbreaking discoveries and new technologies. Given that it's high risk, how do you decide if it's actually worth it to, to go after it and fund it? That's, again, an excellent question. So NSF has what we call the gold standard merit review process. These are colleagues and peers who I have had my own share of proposals being evaluated by such people and teams, the panels. And they look for those nuggets of fantastic ideas that are out there that are proposed by various faculty and researchers across the nation. And it is a very rigorous selection process in terms of those scientific ideas uh, that merit investment. And so there is a, it is not just we randomly invest in high risk ideas, but they go through a rigorous vetting process before they are invested in. And yes, they are high risk, and some of them produce unbelievable outcomes. 
Some of them may seem like they may not have produced a direct outcome, but has contributed to much larger outcomes, like even in the case of the two examples that I talked about. There might have been ideas that we invested in that might not have led to an outcome right away, but over the decades that has shaped itself into amazing possibilities in the future. You know, on the flip side, though, there is the criticism that that process is too rigorous and that there isn't, you know, the NSF doesn't embrace those radically new ideas and it, it sticks to the conventional stuff. What's your reaction to that? In fact, it's quite the opposite. In fact, NSF invests in high-risk ideas and you prefaced it in the previous question exactly that way. In fact, that's what NSF is unique as an agency because our mission in contrast to you know, a specific application area or a specific targeted focus that, we, that most mission agencies might have, our mission is to promote fundamental science and technology ideas. And therefore, we always are looking for high risk, high reward ideas, and our panels and the people that are contributing to the review process themselves are proposers of high risk ideas. And therefore, they're very aware that not all ideas will necessarily see the immediate benefits right away, but that they are important for the advancement of science. You know, one of your priority areas at the NSF is artificial intelligence. Um, there's a lot going on in that field across the government and in industry. What are you um, adding to the AI arena? So if you look at AI today, it is because of sustained investments that NSF has made over the last several decades. So let's be very clear about that. This goes back to addressing some of the previous questions too, is sustained investments over the last five or six decades in computing. And even in AI, in the forms that it took through several versions of AI, and here we are today. And so AI today is made possible by the investments of NSF, and NSF is one of the major investors. In fact, 80% of non-defense research in computer science is invested in by NSF. So that's the first point that I want to make. The second point is, if you look at AI of today, there are still many challenges. We all understand that bias, ethics, privacy, security, and a whole host of problems are in AI today, and we are trying to address them. And so, for example, you as a science and technology policy expert will attest to this, that we need to bring social, behavioral, economic sciences, humanities, and other inspirations as we design these technologies so that we can serve better, we can address these problems early, and therefore produce better solutions. So today we are finding that with AI, we are looking at not only pure AI advancements into the future, but also how AI relates to various applications, agriculture, medicine, weather, and a whole host of applications which determine how AI can be better applied, and how AI innovations can be steered because of the applications and more importantly, bring the social behavioral component. Director, let's talk about this new directorate. It's called the uh, Technology Innovation and Partnership. Why was it created and what's it expected to do? So if you look at the two major things that NSF does really well, is promotion of great ideas, advancement of great ideas, and also advancement of talent. These are two things that NSF does really well all across the nation. So this is a moment of intense global competition. So when these ideas that are amazing ideas that comes out of NSF projects, we need to make sure that we translate those ideas rapidly into technological solutions, prototypes, things of that nature by in partnership with industry and the economic development ecosystems. That's one thing that we want to do really well in our nation so that we can be in the vanguard of competitiveness. And more importantly, that we want to make sure that those ideas are really benefiting humanity, society, and the economy really well. So this is the principal objective. How do you unleash innovations anywhere across the nation? And how do you make opportunities possible everywhere across the nation? How do we accelerate that? How do you strengthen at speed and scale? This is the reason why we launched a cross-cutting directorate of technology innovation and partnerships. And how effective has that shift been kind of away from the pure science and that foundational research towards more tech and innovation? I wouldn't call it a shift at all. Mm -hmm. I would call it an enrichment. So what we are trying to do here, and I, I describe this NSF mission in the form of a DNA example. If you look at what NSF does really well, think of a DNA. One strand of the DNA is what I call curiosity-driven, discovery-based, exploratory research. And everybody knows NSF, that it is a place where it does it really, really well. The other strand, which is called use-inspired, solutions-focused innovations, is also something that NSF has been really good at. There are many examples we can talk about that later. 
But what is important is to understand that this is like a DNA, highly intertwined. Explorations make possible innovations, and innovations in turn inspire more explorations. This symbiotic relationship is what NSF is. So in fact, this focus of TIP is going to leverage more, but also energize even more exploration activities. So it is enrichment, not taking away from one to the other. I just want to be very clear about that. Expansion and scaling. You, you've talked about STEM education in this country a lot. Um, I, I want to ask you what your efforts have been specifically around increasing participation by underrepresented groups. This is a very, very important focus at NSF right now. Because we believe talent and ideas are democratized. They are all across our nation, in all the 50 states, all across the broad socioeconomic demographic and the rich diversity of our nation. So we are investing heavily in specific programs. Let me give you an example. In terms of gender diversity, we launched a program for you know, AP courses in computer science principles. Right? And we made sure that the broad socioeconomic demographic of students get excited by computing and computer science, as an example, as a pathway into STEM. And now I'm happy to report, just in terms of data, from 2017 to 2020, we have from 17,000 students, women taking computer science courses, AP courses, to 40,000. So we are rapidly scaling, whether it is investments in historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges, universities, community colleges. We are making sure that talent everywhere is inspired. Are you optimistic about the state of STEM education in the United States, specifically when it comes to competing with the rest of the world? Yeah. I am fundamentally an optimist. Therefore, I am optimistic, but with the understanding that a lot more needs to be done a lot faster with intentionality and intensity. And that's what I'm trying to make sure that NSF is focused on, is yes, we are doing okay, we need to do a lot more, a lot faster, a lot better. And that's why we're focusing on programs. But by focusing on programs, we are listening to the community. What is working, what is not working, how we might configure NSF to serve better. Uh, regarding, you know, NSF's vision is to lead, right? So lead the world in science and engineering research and development. But really, where are we? When you look at China, when you look at other countries in that arena, yeah. where are we right now? So you look at the, uh, every two years, the National Science Board produces a science and engineering indicators report. If you look at the, the latest report, you will find that our investments overall um, by, by the United States is 29% of the overall R&D investments. Yes, China is catching up. And so clearly we need a lot more work to be done here in terms of increasing the investments that we make in fundamental research. Because it's very clear that it has been shown that all the investments that we make produces unbelievable outcomes through people and ideas and, as I said, technologies for economic and societal prosperity. So that's very clear. But we also need to remember that the entire world is looking to the United States as a model. Everybody wants to see how they can have their NSFs so that it might spur the kind of innovation. But what is exciting about the United States is it's a draw. It's a place because of the democracy and the freedom that we have here that also brings with it the entrepreneurial mindset the innovative mindset, and that makes want, people want to come here and want to be part of this innovative ecosystem. At the same time, if we inspire more domestic talent, which is what I'm focused on, then we get people, domestic talent, excited at the same time. So both the domestic talent and the global talent in the additive form can really inspire amazing innovations that keeps us in the vanguard of competitiveness against all the countries and competitors but we also want to collaborate with them. And so we collaborate with like-minded partners, partners who share our values of openness, transparency, reciprocity, research integrity, respect for intellectual property. All of these are important tenets or values. If countries share those values, we collaborate with them. Well, Mr. Director, there is so much more to talk to you about, but we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Mimi. I really appreciate that. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.